This is lecture two in our course on social phenomenology, self and societies we call it. Uh, topic of the course, topic of the lecture, excuse me, is the definition of the situation, which is a phrase that um, has a long and distinguished history in sociology. Turns out to be really useful in a lot of ways. Uh, the concept does. So we'll talk about that and the notion of the taken for granted. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit as part of that. All right. Now, I've got on the board a couple of things you want to look at. Uh, these are a couple of little short quotes or phrases that we'll reference during the lecture. The other is these names. Uh, so there are four names that come up in today's lecture. Number one is Alfred Schutz, S-C-H-U-T-Z. Alfred Schutz was a, um, an Austrian philosopher who, um, who left Vienna the night before uh, the Nazis took over, before the Germans semi-invaded Austria. Um, the Germans marched into Austria and took over the country and annexed it into Germany in 1938. Um, uh, Right, the Anschluss. Okay, 1938. Anyway, he got out just ahead of, you know, the Germans coming in, which was a very good thing for him and his family. Uh, and he came to the United States and took a job at the New School for Social Research, which is now called New School University, I think. But um, a lot of emigres from Europe went there and basically founded it back in the 30s. Anyway, so he comes up a fair number of times today. Uh, I'll also mention one of his students, a guy named Maurice Natanson, who was um, a generation younger, and I, the dates here, 1923, 1999, I'm not sure about that. It's, it's something like that, okay? He was my mom's age, more or less. Um, he was one of my teachers in graduate school, um, and very interested not only in Schutz, with whom he was quite close, but also Sartre and, you know, kind of blending phenomenology and existentialism. And these two guys together, along with Peter Berger, who turns out to be really important in sociology, uh, and whose book we'll read later in the semester, The Social Construction of Reality, Berger and Lachlan, um, they imported a lot of these ideas into American sociology from European philosophy. Um, so that's how the whole, this whole line of thought came to exist in uh, American sociology, which uh, in some ways was quite ambivalent about this whole way of thinking about the world. All right. Third name is Irving Goffman, who, um, who was a Canadian sociologist, uh, 1921 to 1981, died when he was just 60. Died the year he was president of the American Sociological Association, actually, so he never gave his presidential address. Couldn't make the meetings. Um, you've probably heard of him already. Maybe you've read some of his stuff. We will read um, at least two long essays that he wrote. One is called On Face Work. The other is called De On Deference and Demeanor, which I know some of you read in intro, in my intro class. Anyway, Irving Goffman also pops up here now and then. All right. If you're going to learn a name, Goffman's the one to learn, by the way. It's the other people, eh, you know, okay, you've heard of them now, that's fine. Uh, oh, and the other one is W.I. Thomas, who um, coined the term, the definition of the situation, back in 1926 or thereabouts. I'm not sure exactly where. There, was, there were several different things he wrote. but. Um, and the phrase, the expression he's known for is, situations defined as real are real in their consequences. And we will get to that. Okay? That's what's on the board. All right. So, last time, um, we went through this whole sentence about I live in a meaningful world. Last time meaning the first lecture. Excuse me. Uh, I live in a meaningful world. And we sort of tried to untangle that and figure out what that meant. And... Uh, we came out with this notion that I'm stuck in the world, that, that I'm sort of inescapably trapped in the world that I live in. But that world has meaning, right? And objects in it are not just ambiguously what they appear to be, but they can have different sorts of meanings and so on, depending on my own projects and goals and things like that. When we read Sartre, right, the um, 
essay on existentialism is a humanism. Uh, it, that's the formal title of that lecture. I think in your book it was just called Existentialism. Um, the, the article that we talked about on Thursday, though, um, we discussed this idea that, that a person, I have no choice but to act in the world, right? I'm totally responsible. There's no escaping it. I have to do stuff. Even not doing stuff is doing stuff. That whole idea, right? Which is a foundation principle for existentialist philosophy. We also, I, I mentioned at some point in the lecture that, so we have this freedom to act in the world, but there are ways of doing that. And the term I may have used from Alfred Schutz is gearing into the world. I'm able to, so it's as if I'm the machine with these little gears running, I'm able to connect to other gears out there in the world and make things happen. All right, this is really important. A nice way to think about this that I use is, is that it's almost as if you have a, a recipe file for how to get things done. All right? For instance, uh, you walk into <coughs> class and you look around and you go, hmm, looks like a class. You know? Says so on the schedule, here's the, here's the room, I see the tables, I see other students, people have books, there's a professor looking character up front. I know how to do things. And it says if you reach in your file and it, under C it says classes, comma, taking. And you pull it out and it says sit down, take out notebook, pull out pen, pretend to listen, etc. Right? So there are things you have to do in order to be a student in a class, right? And you kind of know how that works. And that applies to all sorts of things in life. You know how to go to the dining hall and get a meal. Now, maybe the first time you walked in, you looked around, you go, what's this? And you, oh, I went to summer camp. This is a dining hall. They probably have a stack of plates. It's probably a cafeteria. And you, again, it says if you go through and say dining halls, cafeteria, pull it out. It says pick up plate, walk to, you know, don't get at the head of the line, whatever it is, right? And it tells you how to go through those steps. Now, you do have to learn a lot of that. Like little kids learn all that stuff, right? That's why they go to kindergarten, which somebody years ago called society's boot camp. Kindergarten is where you learn sort of the rudimentary behaviors of being a member of society. Now, a lot of people have learned it before then, but not everybody. You know, when adult talks, listen. Sit quietly. Don't grab other kids all of those little instructions that you have to learn along the way about how to operate in the world, how to gear into the world, and again, how to get things done. For instance, the example I gave last time was how to hail a cab in New York City. Right? You want to go somewhere, you know, okay, hand up in the air. I had to learn that. I was 40 years old. Somebody shows me how to do that, right? how to drive a car, and so on. All right, so there are lots of different things like that. You folks, you know, for instance, um, well, if I said, okay, uh, on, on Friday, or maybe Thursday night, I don't know, maybe Wednesday night, the weekend starts, right? We have a thing called a weekend. Now, if you flip through your little file and look under the section called weekends, there's a number of sections. One of them, it says fun. Okay, you pull it out, and that card has maybe hmm, five different things on it. How to have fun on the weekend. And everybody kind of knows what that involves. And that card says some things that it said when I was in college, but there are some other things as well. Some of those things have changed a bit. How to do a weekend, how to do fun on a weekend. But we can do all that stuff. All right. You even know uh, things like how to fall in love. Right? There are patterns for doing all of that. And, and so to speak, recipes that people let's say learn. Sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it isn't. Right? Like first first time you go on a date, I don't know if you if people do this anymore, but you know, when when I did it, first date, oh gosh. Maybe I won't tell that story. All right. So um, anyway, somebody had to sort of explain the rudimentary parts of it, you know, like you call up, you say, Hi, this is, you know, this is Danny Campbell. Right? And I said, would you like to go to the dance? 
And then something, I heard something at the other end. Like, what? <laughs> and, then, and then I hear it again. It was like, okay. <laughs> All right? Yeah, oh, okay, you're on your way, right? <laughs> I'm learning things, and I'm filling out those little cards of how to do stuff. Okay, now, you can, you can here's the important part for today's lecture, or a big chunk of that. Um, you can do that because other people have those cards too, right? And because situations you encounter are, we can say, typical, right? You walk in the classroom, you look, you go, wow, it's a classroom. Pretty straightforward. Or somebody says, okay, there's a dance at the junior high or middle school, you would say now, and uh, uh, you, you're supposed to get a date. Uh -huh. okay. But you kind of know the other person knows this too, right? So you can gear into the world, right? So you can do your part and they pull out their card and they go, the answer is yes. Not, what are you talking about? <laughs> go away. And at the other end, her mom's saying, don't say that. You can't say go away. Say, I have to wash my hair. <laughs> or whatever, right? There are ways of saying yes and no and so on. All right. All right. So you can deal with other people because uh, they're typical and they're recognizable. So you see types of people in the world, like professor. So you walk in the classroom and you look, and there's some older guy there, and he's got glasses on, he's writing on the board. Must be the professor, right? Not Somebody from the dining hall, okay, and you recognize me as such, and I see you, and I go, hmm, looks like students. Periodically, you make mistakes, of course, right, which is always interesting and funny, like there's some other professor in the classroom, and I tell him to sit down and start taking notes, and it doesn't work so good, <laughs> right, and that, that sort of thing happens, but mostly we, we get along okay. All right, so number one point is, and this is a phrase from, um, well, I think it's from Schutz, although Nate and used to use it all the time. So I, I, I'm actually not straight on whose it is. I think it's Schutz's, but, okay, which is typification is the key to the everydayness of the world. In other words, the key to making everyday life, the way we use that phrase, right? the key to making everyday life possible is typification, which is a big fancy word, deliberately so. For the, for the process of creating types of things and activities and people and so on, right? Our ability to classify, in other words, is the key to making daily life routine. Right? So you classify everything so you can deal with them and you ignore the differences. So I walk in, you're all sitting here, well there, I already said it. You're all, like all of you, as if you're a bunch of different things all of the same type that I can see as a mass, right? I recognize you as students. Now, the miracle, of that, and that allows me to do stuff, right? Like, oh, students, better start teaching. But I had to do something for that to happen. Namely, I had to think of you as a student. Not as, ooh, there's an interesting person. Or, ooh, you know, there's a lacrosse player, and there's another one. <laughs> right? I had to see you as this or that or the other. Uh, I had to typify you. I, and in doing that, I had to suppress the differences. I had to ignore all the differences between you. I mean, I can tell, obviously, you know, there are men, there are women, they're tall and short, and, you know, blonde and redhead and so on. But basically, for the purposes of getting along in the class, I suppress those differences. You're a student. That's the most important thing. And I've imposed that view, you might say, on the world. As you can tell, anytime you deal with a two-year-old. Because a two-year-old, everything's different, right? They run in, they're like, whoa! A bag! <laughs> and then they go, you know, and then they find something else. They see a chair, and then there's a different chair. And they're sort of amazed by all the differences in things in the world. And part of what's fun about being around little kids is you see that and you go, that's right, they are kind of different, aren't they? I'd never thought about that. You know, and they, they could spend hours looking at someone. You know, and they keep doing it over and over again because they're so amazed by the particular thing that happens to be in front of them. Which is why the key to dealing with two-year-olds with a problem 
is learning about distraction. So when they get off on some bad tangent, you're like, oh, look at this. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and they go running over and grab this. They, they don't suppress differences very well, is another way to put it. OK. But we do. We meaning what Goffman would call competent adults, a phrase he likes to use. Once you're a competent adult or something you know, moving in that direction, you learn to suppress the differences among all sorts of things and deal with typical situations. And we treat them as, for all practical purposes, the same. So for all practical purposes, pen, one pen will work just as well as any other. Because the main thing you do with pens is write. Okay? Or the main thing you do with toilets is use them as a toilet, right? You don't care about the differences. And yet, there are huge differences between toilets. And there are people in the world, there are people in the world who spend their lives working on the design of toilets. And there are books in libraries. I kid you not. You can go and find books. I mean big, thick, serious books with lots of elaborate designs and diagrams and arrows and angles and curves and stuff like that, where you can go and look at different, all different kinds of toilets. Somebody wrote that book. <laughs> OK? It's on their resume. And they probably made a lot of money on it because it turns out this is a really important subject, but not for most of us, right? Because somebody else is taking care of that, right? Uh, my, um, my stepson is a fly fisherman. I mean, he kind of does it professionally. So he just went to a big conference, big uh, trade show in New Jersey, and there were tens of thousands of people in the, what's it called? I forget what it's called. It's in Somerset, New Jersey. It's like the New Jersey, you know, conference m megatron or something. I don't know what it is. It's some <laughs> huge thing surrounded by hotels, right, where they have big conventions. And they just had what's called the fly fishing show. It's the world's biggest convention of people into fly fishing. And they had dozens and dozens of booths for fly tying alone. People sitting, mm, doing this, and talking about it, getting all into it, all right? There's a whole world out there that can be almost infinitely expanded. And Maurice Natanson, actually, one of my graduate school teachers, was into this. He used to buy fly fishing catalogs and go through and look at all the equipment. There's lots of different kinds of equipment. He didn't fish. <laughs> okay? Maurice Natanson didn't fish, but he loved looking at catalogs just as he said, just to appreciate how little we appreciate, you might say, how to understand how much variety is out there that normally we suppress. Okay, so uh, you accomplish this trivialization of differences. That's the point here. Point number two, these types of, let's say, objects or situations or people in the world are what we might think of as reciprocal. That is, they, they imply each other. They go together. For instance, uh, I, well, in Sartre's example last time, you can't be a lover unless there's a beloved. You need another person in order to do that. You can claim, oh, I'm really the world's greatest lover. I just haven't met the right person. No. <laughs> OK, it doesn't work that way. Right? You can't be uh, a parent without a child. You can't be a teacher without a student. You could probably be a student without a teacher, okay? But that's a, mm. most for most purposes. Well, you can't be a student without somebody to learn from. Maybe that's a way to put it. You can be a student and you're reading a book. Okay, that is to say the student needs the book in order to be a student. Right? A teacher needs students to be a teacher. Right? Father needs a child or you know, can't be a dad, can't do it. The way a lock needs a key. You know, the two things go together. And that's true of all of our kind of social relationships and who we are. Well, the interesting twist on this is, is things like, you, you, I mean, this is big in Goffman's whole way of thinking about things, is you need other people to be who you are. Okay? You need other people to be who you are or to be at least who you want to be. Uh, for instance, you can't be nice without somebody accepting 
that niceness. If you try to be good to somebody else, you try to be, I don't know, I'm walking in KJ, I pull the door open for somebody. They, they can say, oh, thank you, which is what they usually do, and they walk in. They could stop and go, what's this about? <laughs> right? And that happens. You, you, you laugh. You recognize this happens, right? And there are people who, in effect, they get offended, for instance. They think you're being condescending. They think you're trying to make up. You think I'm going to forget that other business, huh? <laughs> Open the door for me. <laughs> okay? So um, I know there are two people I know, friends. And uh, they got in a fight a while back, kind of a big argument, let's say. And recently, um, well, there's a he and a she, as it turns out. Okay, he sends her an email about some businessy thing they're doing, and at the end says, uh, "Happy New Year to you and your family." Right? She writes back and says, "I don't see how you can say that. How can you say Happy New Year to me and my family?" She says, "What does that mean?" Question. Okay, I guess we're not on good terms, are we? <laughs> right? But you recognize that. In other words, she refused to accept it as a nice gesture. She thinks, oh, hmm, oh, happy new year. <laughs> like he's still trying to be a little snide with her or something, right? You can't be nice unless the other person accepts it. You can't be funny. I mean, I tell little, you know, little semi-funny little jokes or something, and you all laugh. <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, I'm funny dude. <laughs> right? I feel sort of like, that's good, that's what I wanted. But what if I were saying things, I'm like, typification is the key to the everydayness of the world. Y'all just crack up. Ha ha ha! I'm like, that's not supposed to be funny. You know, so, so I had an idea of who I was and where I was going, and you said, nope, we're heading this way. Right? So in order to be, we'll see how this unfolds through the whole course, actually. In order to be any kind of person, you need other people to be collaborating with you, right? Cooperating. It's very hard to be anybody without the support of other people. All right, or a different way to put it is, I define myself, right? Title of the course at Hamilton is Self in Society. I define myself through my relations with other people, which is kind of a paradox. That is, we think of the self as being, oh, this is me. Well, eh, not really so much. Turns out it's pretty much given to me by other people. All right, so number three. The typified world, that is this world we live in of all these types of situations and people and kinds of folks and objects, the typified world is relatively anonymous. Uh, Nathanson wrote one of his last books on this whole topic of anonymity, actually. Um, that is to say, we approach almost everything as an example of something not as a unique situation. I mean, there might be unique, well, unique is a big word, right? People way overuse it. It's very unusual to encounter something like we've never encountered before. We don't do that because what happens is when we do encounter something like we've never encountered before, we tend to absorb it back into a type. Say, oh, got it. It's a religious revelation. That's what this is. I know, I've heard about these. I read a book sometime. You know. We try to reclassify things into, so to speak, normal ways of doing stuff. Now, this comes through in lots of, lots of situations. I just mentioned one or two things, though. Um, I'll just point out that something like naming people, when you name someone, uh, that by itself gives a sort of distance to the relationship. You've typified the person as a type of thing. For instance, uh, my wife is a Susan. There are a ton of Susans in the world, let me tell you, especially her age. Right? I mean, there are a ton of Susans. She wrote five in her elementary school class alone. A lot of Susans in those years. Uh, and now our granddaughter is named Susan. So every so often people get confused. You know, they call up and say, is Susan there? Like, which one? Although usually we know. <laughs> right? You can tell which one they want. By the way, <laughs> oh, that's for the little one. <laughs> All right? And so on. All right. But even names give a kind of distance, which is funny. So, um, I don't know. You meet somebody. 
And at first you call them maybe by, maybe, maybe you're in a work situation and you first say, oh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, I don't know, Ms. Jenkins. And then it's, oh, that's Sharon. And then you start being more friendly with Sharon. Pretty soon it's Char. And then you get like real friendly and it's like Snookums. <laughs> right? Or a honey bun. Or cutie. Or mmm. And at a certain point in that relationship, you may get so close that it's offensive to call the person by any name at all. Right? That is, there are moments when you're not supposed to use the person's name. Right? Which implies a certain degree of intimacy. A serious degree of intimacy. And what you recognize then is that using their name at that point sort of re-separates people. A good example of that would be uh, uh, you're talking to your kid, you know. Anthony Michael Calabresi, you get in here this minute. Anthony Michael Calabresi. What was that? And the kid's like, oh, I'm in big trouble now. And he knows that. Why does he know that? What is it about the formal name of a person that lets them know they're in trouble? Well, what it means is that mom has now, you know, there's some distance there. Dad is saying, I now regard you as this official person. Not as, honey, can you come in here for a minute so I can hit you? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't work, right? Wouldn't work. <laughs> right? Even the tone of voice changes and everything. But, but specifically, the naming thing is something worth paying attention to. Now, I've talked so far as if we have these recipes, and this is all kind of worked out, but that's not really the way it works, right? That was just a way of getting you to think about it. This stuff occurs spontaneously. Whether you, I mean, sometimes you think about it and it has to be planned and so on. But it's going to happen regardless. You just spontaneously do it. We live that way. Or, to put it sort of formally, and this is a term that will come up a lot in the course. Oh man, let's see if I can spell right. Okay. These are pre-predicative actions, is what philosophers would call them. Okay, so a predicative action would be one that has a subject and a predicate. That is, you can put it into a sentence. It's kind of, you might say, formalized or lived as if it were thought out. Pre-predicative stuff is just done. You just do it. There's no, it happens before, that is pre, you've formulated it, what's going on. Right? Before you've put it, so to speak, into a sentence. There's pre-predicative action. Okay, so this happens a lot. That's going to come up over and over again in the course. All right, fifth point. Then we get to the definition of the situation. Okay, these types of, that we've talked about, you know, types of people and situations and actions and so on, these types go together. They fit together. It's not just that, you know, the lover and the beloved or the professor and the student... There's professor and student and room and time and place and objects that go with it. There's a whole bunch of stuff here that you recognize as having a part in this play, you might say. Okay, now Irving Goffman, when I said play, Irving Goffman was famous for presenting what was called the dramaturgical view of society. In other words, he treated society as if it were a theater. And these things we do all the time are little plays. Right? And they have a setting and a scene and, and, and certain time and there are people in charge, they're like directors and they're actors who have their different parts and so on. And he did a lot with that, with that metaphor, okay? But things go together and everything kind of fits and we'll, we will elaborate on that coming up. Okay, so, part two. In any situation you walk into, there is what we might call the definition of the situation. This phrase is from W.I. Thomas, this sociologist back in the 1920s, 30s. And the, he said, what? Okay. The definition of the situation is, this phrase is really useful, 
is whatever it is that answers the question, what is going on here? So you walk into a room and there are a bunch of students. You walk into a dorm room one night and everybody's in there talking and stuff. And you walk in and the room falls silent. And you go, hey, uh, what's going on, guys? And they look at each other with their eyes kind of open like this. Uh, beer pong. Yeah, yeah, we're playing beer pong. Yeah, come on in. We weren't talking about you. <laughs> All right? Or, or uh, we're talking about sociology. Yeah, yeah, it's really intense. I've been worrying about pre-predicative actions. All right? Maybe that's what's going on. They're talking about a class, or they're playing a game of some sort, or they're gossiping about you. All of those are possible. So anytime you go into a situation, the first thing you've got to do is figure out what's going on here. Right? What's the definition of this situation? Right? So, for instance, you, uh, uh, you sit down at dinner, and there are a group of people, and they're talking. And maybe one person is making sort of remarks about somebody else at the table. And you listen, and they sound to you, maybe the remarks sound kind of mean, you know, like, Whoa, dude, this is kind of harsh. What's going on? And you're looking, and you're looking. And the other person, the person being talked about, is laughing. And they seem kind of relaxed and fine. You go, oh, I guess they're just kind of joking around. Maybe this is kind of what they do. Or then you see the other person, you know, okay, all right, let's move on. Okay, all right. And you see other people, you know, and you, you look, you're looking for the signs. Is this a friendly conversation? Are they joking around? Is it serious insult? All right. Is this uh, intimidating or challenging or nice or intimate even, right? Like my brother and I have conversations. Oh my Lord, nobody else in the world. But, you know, I couldn't talk to anybody the way I talk to my brother. And he, or he to me, you know. He, oh God, it's awful. And I keep hoping, you know, maybe I could find a friend you could actually do that. It's hard to do. And, you know, you can talk about how that works, but anyway, so a situational definition, uh, you try to nail it down. But some, some situations are intentionally ambiguous, of course. That's what flirtation's all about. Like, are we really going that way? No, 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 maybe no. Maybe no. Maybe no. <laughs> and you can kind of have fun with it because it's ambiguous. That's part of what's appealing about it. If it were an all or nothing clear cut situation, wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. Okay. So, point two. So first is you, you need to answer that question. But number two, you're looking for signs to interpret and figure out the answer. Figure out what's going on. Like you meet somebody new and you want to know if they're nice. So first thing is you're like, Hi, I'm Dan. And you're like, Hi, I'm Meg. She's smiling. That's good, right? Because my little recipe card says, smile, nice. By the way, this is incredibly misleading. There are people in the world, I can tell you, who smile a lot and are vicious. <laughs> I, I'm just speaking from experience, right? On the other hand, there are people who never smile. I mean, I have friends. I have a friend. Never smiles. Nicest person you ever want to meet. How do you know that? Though. You know, because other things happen and so on. But the signs are kind of out of sync with what, with the way we think things ought to be working. I guess um, uh, posture. Okay, I got to stand up straight. This is something I'm working. On. I have, I have back problems. So, okay, I got to stand up straight. Looks better. Makes a big difference. I see it on the tape. Wow, looks better if I stand up straight. I keep doing this. I could turn out like Mitt Romney. <laughs> okay, so Mitt Romney, he's astonishing. This guy, I'm not speaking to his policies, you understand? But he is tall, and he is good looking, and he's got a big jaw, and he looks like, and he's smart, right? And then when he says stuff, when he says stuff, he looks serious about it. This country must walk forward boldly into the 21st century. I don't know what he says, but you know, he says stuff, and people say, boy, golly, that guy is solid as a rock, steadfast. Right? He is steadfast and strong and he'll be a bold leader and blah, blah, blah. He's committed. That kind of stuff. Next day, he changes his mind. 
I mean, the, I watched this during the con during the, uh, the campaign last fall. He would take utterly different positions on the same issue in the course of a week, and each time, people said, he's serious about that. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. It was great. Now, there are other people. Bill Clinton was pretty good at this, too. But that's another story. All right. <laughs> Where he, I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> and I'm looking at him. I remember when he did this. Y'all are too young for this. But 20 years ago, when he did this, or 15, whenever it was. Did, have you seen this? You ever see this tape? I did not have sex with that woman. I was watching it on live TV. I'm like, he sure looks like he's telling the truth. I mean, all the signs say he's telling the truth. But I know he's lying. <laughs> you know? It's really tough. But, but you're looking for the signs. That this point isn't about Bill Clinton. Okay. There are all sorts of conventional signs we use then to understand what's going on, whether people are serious or not, whether they're honest, whether they're nice, and so on. But sometimes things just go haywire. So um, I went to college. All right, so I grew up in Tennessee in the 1960s, very conservative, very southern, very white, you know, all those things, right? And my, I mean, 100% segregation in a city that was 50-50 white black. Went to an all-white school. Okay, I went to a military academy, right? Six years and marching and saluting and all this. And Christian, you know, prayer twice a day, all this kind of, all right, very, very conservative. I then went to college. Here's what happened the third day I was at college. Now, so the first couple of days, I'm there, I'm meeting a lot of people. There are a lot of hippies, a lot of kids from New York. You know, it looks kind of wild. Fine. I'm, you know, I'm good. You know, okay. I got my little Bermuda shorts and so on. <laughs> anyway, I changed to, to gym shorts pretty fast. This is in Florida, by the way. It's not here. Uh, see that here? See a guy in gym shorts here in winter? Wait. Well, anyway, all right. So, um, there I am at college, and I met, I met a bunch of people. One person I met my first day or two, because she was friends with my roommate, who was an upperclassman. Um, uh, we'll call her Lily. Uh, Lily was Norwegian by extraction. Do you know the word sylph, S-Y-L-P-H? No. Uh, uh, Lily was tall and thin and elegant beyond belief. And she had this longish blonde hair. She never wore any makeup or anything like She didn't need it. And I remember watching her walk into the cafeteria, like the first or second day there, and she just kind of, you know, she comes flowing into the room. I'm like, uh, right? I'm straight out of high school, you understand? And I like, how did God create it? How did God create it? <laughs> Picture like this. I mean, she had style. So. There I am, now I had been a swimmer in high school. So like, this is like the third day of orientation. I was out at the swimming pool. This is, again, this is Sarasota, Florida. It's gorgeous. It's like six o'clock in the evening. The sun is setting over the, the Gulf of Mexico. The palm trees, you know, the hibiscus, I mean, you know, the whole deal, right? And, I'm, and I go out to the pool. There's nobody there but the lifeguard and me, right? I'm, I'm swimming my little laps, because you know, I'm like trying to let people know, I don't know, I'm a really good swimmer. But, you know, I'm doing all this. Anyway, I'm lying there kind of with my arm in the gutter, dawdling on my feet like this. Out to the pool comes Lily, right? She's wearing this, this uh, yellow sundress. And she walks in the gate and sees me. And she's, she had met her. Me, she had met me, right? But she's, again, she's a sophomore, you understand? It, ergo, very sophisticated. <laughs> I mean, that's my view. <laughs> she comes out, she kind of waves, right? And I'm like, uh -huh, hi, Lily. <laughs> and she goes over to this little table, and she reaches down, does one of these things, you know, how you take it, and she lifts up the sundress, and underneath she's wearing nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. She is stark naked. And she walks over to the edge of the pool, dives in, swim, 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 swim. This is true, you understand? <laughs> she comes up in front of me like this and does one of these <laughs> and says, hi. <laughs> now, all I can think, I'm like 18, right? Straight, straight out of my little boys' military school in Tennessee. I'm like, all I can think is, be cool. <laughs> 
It's like, hey, no big deal. <laughs> it's perfectly natural. You know, I mean, this kind of it's insane, right? But I, but you know, I'm trying, and but all the other signs. I mean, she, it's a public place. She didn't say like, let's go to my room and you know get it. She didn't. I mean, there was no. You know, it seemed like she's just having a conversation with me, totally naked. And <laughs> so I'm trying to put together the pieces, right? And what you know, but what's going on in the back of my head is like, this is college. This is college. This is college. <laughs> you know, like the rules are all different. You know, you got to. You got to make a transition there, so that's what I had to do, and it was it was great. College was swell, <laughs> and I hope it's good for you too. Okay, but the elements. All right. So next point. Next point. Third is that the elements of these scenes then have to fit together, as we said. So there's a time and a setting and a place and people, and you kind of know how those situations are supposed to work. At least once you make the transition into that new, in this case, into that new world. Like, okay, people swim naked at the college pool. They act like it's no big deal. Don't get all worked up, okay? It's not, you're supposed to say, hi, how are you? How's philosophy class? Or whatever, all right? Minor scenes, um, you ever watch football games on TV? Uh, like college football games in particular is what I'm thinking of. Uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll, the camera will go down the sidelines and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll see some player and the player sees the camera. I don't know how often they still do this, but you know the camera, all right, what happens? Player looks and sees that a camera's on him. What does he do? Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Right, exactly. He go, hi. <laughs> like that. That's what they're supposed to do. Now, how long does that last? Ballpark. 20, 20 minutes? <laughs> Half hour? One second? Maybe, you know, maybe five seconds, right? I mean, you have a clear sense of what would be too long. <laughs> you know, he starts trying to, you know, get the groceries kind of. You know, <laughs> don't forget the lactate, right? I, I don't know. Like chicken noodle soup. He doesn't do that. Like, can't really cut. Get off the guy, he's a nut. <laughs> or, or the opposite. Suppose they put the camera on him and he sees the camera and he doesn't do anything. What do you think? What do you think? He looks at the camera and does uh, Yeah. He's so used to being on camera he doesn't react anymore. That's possible. That's possible, right? No big deal to him, he doesn't care. That's very possible. Or if it's, if it's like a college, a small college gets on TV or something and they don't do the high mom thing, they're like, you think, what a jerk, right? So there's a kind of space between being a jerk and being totally nutso, like giving your grocery list. There's a space in which it's possible to be a normal human being <laughs> in that situation, right? Same thing works for a class like this. If you come into class and I'm teaching and I'm talking and things are going along, you know, it gets to be 3.30, 3.45, you know, you're like, eh, eh, eh. 4 o'clock, 5, 8.30. <laughs> you're like, I gotta eat, right? I gotta go to dinner, I gotta practice, whatever. You're not, class isn't supposed to run way long. You have a really clear sense of how long things are supposed to take. Or walking across the bridge and you see a friend, right? Classic example I love in the intro students are like, you know, you say, hi, how are you? Hey, pretty good, how's you? Okay, okay. That's what usually happens. Oh, got it, yeah, got on the way to class. Yeah, me too, yep, boom, boom, and you're gone. Right? You know how long it's supposed to be. Hi, how are you? Well, I've been having this kind of funny pain <laughs> in my side, you know, and two years ago I got this same sort of thing, and you're like, oh, you know, hey, dude, I gotta go, you know, class is coming up or whatever, right? And people, People who take too long in conversations and keep going when the time is done and you want to get out of there, or people who on the other end don't do it at all, right? You go, hey, how's it going? They're like, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, right? Too long and too short. So there's a space between those where we call you a competent adult. Goffman would call you a competent adult. Okay, so number four. All right, so things fit together. You look for signs, you try to figure out what the situation is, what's going on here, how it works, and so on. The problem is that definitions of situations are always 
inherently ambiguous. They can be modified. Things are up for grabs. We gave the example last time of, uh, of hemostats as an object that can have lots of different meanings, right? It can be a roach clip or it can be something to clamp off uh, blood vessels or whatever. The same with shoes. Shoes can be something for walking. Shoes can be something for looking at, you know, or admiring or whatever. Shoes can be an erotic object, okay, were the three examples I gave last time. It's true of all kinds of stuff. Um, and you can spin situations in different ways. To go back to Bill Clinton, who was great at all sorts of things like this, um, when he was president, maybe it was when he was a candidate, somebody asked him if he had ever used marijuana. And he said, I may have experimented. Experimented? That's what he said. I, I experimented with marijuana. Like, it was very scientific. He put on, <laughs> put on a lab coat. You know, he laid out different samples, because you know, if you're going to experiment, you gotta try everything. <laughs> right? So you can make a fair comparison, that kind of business. Like he was very intellectual about, you know, it's like, okay, I tried things out, sure, when I was young. They asked Newt Gingrich the same question, who was Speaker of the House of Representatives at that point. They asked him the same thing. And his response was, everybody else was doing it. The other guys, I can't do a Newt Gingrich imitation, so. <laughs> but, you know, everybody else was doing it. That was his answer, which is a very different way of spinning the situation, right? So on Clinton's part, he's sort of appealing to an audience of, you know, at least intellectually inclined type people, or, you know, experimentation, you know, it's good, curiosity is good, you know. He was curious in a lot of ways, but you know, okay, he was working on this one at the time. And then Newt, on the other hand, is like, he's one of the guys, you know, we're all in there together, you know, it'd be rude to not go along. <laughs> okay, different ways of thinking about the same kind of situation. I'll give you another example. Here's an ambiguous one. So, it's not totally unlike my, uh, Swimming pool story, in fact, but it's somehow different. Anyway, years and many, many years ago, I lived in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I lived in a dump, okay? It was a, a converted garage that had a one tiny little walk-in sort of shower that used to electrocute you periodically. <laughs> well, because the water heater was rusted out, and so the wires were... Anyway, it was, it was a real shocker the first time, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, oh, that's the shower. It does that sometimes. <laughs> Good. So I didn't have a bathtub. Anyway, uh, I met this woman. So I was like 27 or something. Tw no, I was 24 at the time. It was 1977. Um, and uh, she told me her name was, well, she told me her real name, okay? But she liked to be called Magnolia Blanc. Magnolia Blanc. It was like a Tennessee Williams character was kind of the idea. And she was into that sort of thing. So I said, my Magnolia Blanc. She was a little funny. Um, <laughs> very nice. And so we went out, you know, a couple of times. No big deal. No big deal at this point, right? We're just sort of friendly. And, you know, I mean, it might be going somewhere. We're friendly. And I told her in the course of a conversation that the shower in my apartment was electrocuting me. And... Um, there's no bathtub, and I really, really like taking baths. Still do. <laughs> Go figure. And um, she said, well, I have a bathtub. I'm like, oh, is that? <laughs> and she said, you'll have to come over sometime. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm good with that, right? So we made the arrangements. <laughs> and I went over to her house, you know, like Saturday or whatever. And um, sure enough, she had a bathtub, a big, nice bathtub with feet, you know, one of these old-fashioned things. And she had set up the whole room, the bathroom, like there were candles lit. And she fills the tub, you know, and it's steaming, and she pours in some unguents and oils of some sort, right? And there are others on the little table. And then she undresses me, puts me in the bathtub, and walks out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. 
definition of the situation, <laughs> look for the signs, it's supposed to all fit together, <laughs> right? I, clearly I was misreading some of the cues, but I couldn't figure out what it was. You know, but I'm, I'm cool, right? I'd been through this situation with Lily early, I'm like, ah, okay, whatever, you know, you do your thing. And, and so I decided just to sit there and enjoy, I might as well enjoy the bath. <laughs> so I did, and when I got out, I, you know, I get dried off, I get dressed, I walk out in the front room, she's, she's on her living room floor doing yoga. <laughs> and, and I never even said, I, I was like, you know, I wanted to say, am I missing something here? You know, did I read too much into this situation? Was I assuming things I shouldn't have assumed? But, I, you know, I didn't have the nerve. I was like, well, I don't know. Like, why would you think that? I, I had no answer. I didn't, I didn't. And I still don't. I just have no idea what happened. <laughs> I have no idea. She was very odd, actually. <laughs> okay. But, but, in fact, usually. So situations have this inherent ambiguity where things can go wrong or turn out not to be the way you thought. And that happens all the time in relationships, obviously, of that sort. You know, when you're starting up, you're not sure where it's going. But, but it happens in a lot of other ways. But normally, things look normal, right? And this is what you're going to read about in um, Beyond Caring, in the chapters for Thursday, right? Is about how people move into making a situation normal when it's initially quite, quite abnormal. Okay, but usually we have a kind of suspension of disbelief, as they say in, in the study of poetry. We accept the official version of what's going on in a lot of situations. We assume as they say in horror movies, there's a logical explanation for all this. Now, there are some people in the world, Sartre actually mentions them in that essay you read, or actually it's later in the book, I guess, it's page 92, 93, which I think is past the sections we read. Sartre refers to people who have what he calls the serious attitude. Now, the serious attitude is one that says the world is what it is. And there's no ambiguity about it. Things could, things have to be the way they are in fact. The serious person is one who thinks, uh, for instance, that a grade <laughs> means something. I guess is my direct take on it. That, that a grade really does represent that's how you did in the course. And that's the way it is. Right? And they take that, we say, seriously. They, they sort of can't laugh about it or step outside of that situation. Laughter, by the way, is a great um, thing to think about because humor frequently, usually, I would say, probably always, involves seeing a situation as intrinsically ambiguous, where you can move outside of the official definition and see it in a different way, that that's what we're doing when you make something funny. Um, at any rate, so, uh, oh, my other example, Okay, the intro students know this, of course, but um, so that's a $20 bill, right? So I take that fairly seriously. I don't know about you, but you know, I take, but you know, periodically people do that. They're like, oh, wait a minute. So there's a little bit of a, wait a minute. <laughs> you're like, you're not supposed to do that. Because that's a serious thing, right? Now, what's, what's funny about it is that. I mean, I'll tell you, just so you know, you can scotch tape them back together perfectly good, as long as the serial numbers match. Um, and I'll do that later, because I take <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a funny guy, but I'm not Michael Bloomberg. You know? <laughs> okay, so, um, well, okay, which is another story. Right, different people take money serious, more or less seriously, depending on all kinds of things. Uh, at any rate, so, this is a piece of paper, but we think it has a certain value, right? And it, we think that value is kind of in the paper, almost. Like, there it is. It's real. Money is real. But a sociologist would say, people give money its value, and it could be lost at any moment. So if, for instance, uh, let's say something really weird happens with weather. Hurricane hits Hamilton College t this afternoon, and people just need food and water and stuff. Money might not work the way we're used to it working. 
You know, it might be a gun works better. Right? Works a lot better. And all of a sudden, this thing, which we think has a kind of intrinsic meaning and value, just becomes trash. Right? Or, different example, let's say, uh, well, okay, the money example again. Let's say you're a rich guy, but you commit some heinous crime that everybody knows about, but you get away with it. But everybody in their village decides they're not going to take your money at all. You'd be up a creek. Because in fact, what that points out, that kind of example points out, is that the only reason money has value is that other people allow it to. Right? You've kind of agreed to do something in certain ways such that money has value. It doesn't, it's, not an, it's not intrinsic to the thing itself. Now, sociologically what's interesting, and we get into this a lot in the second half of the course, is that that routine, is that, uh, is that the value of all sorts of things, no, let me rephrase that. Our sense that things and people and situations and all have intrinsic meaning, our sense of that is socially created, that is other people have to do it with us, and that's reinforced by ongoing ritualized activities. Example, I think I'm a nice guy. I mean, this is true, I actually did. And I see people every day, I see people and I go, hi! And then I see Chelsea, hi! And Chelsea goes, hi! And I'm like, see? Nice guy. Get along, Chelsea thinks so. And then I come in and I talk to you and they're smiling. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I feel pretty good. I think I'm the person, I, I'm reinforced in my belief of who I am. Because over and over again through the day, people, you know, I think I'm a nice, I must be a reasonably smart guy. I say things, people write them down. That's good, yeah, okay, that works. And, and you get that, or I think money means something. I, I take it to Cafe Opus, and I say, I want, <coughs> you know, a, uh, 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 well, okay. I want a skim milk decaf mocha. Right? And they're, they're trying not to laugh. I understand that part. Like, you want a skim milk, what's the point, you know? By the time I'm done with the specification, just give me water, you know? I don't care. But, but, and I give them money, and they give me the mocha. I give them a piece of paper and they hand me stuff. It's great. So I say, that, that paper means something. It's not just a piece of paper. Right? But that exists, again, only because over and over again we do these back and forths between us that reinforce that. Okay, so number three, the routine. So uh, first, the, the suspension of disbelief. Like normally we believe in stuff. That belief is reinforced by routinized activity. We'll get into interaction rituals in the second half of the course. We really talk about that. All right. Number three, the routine, that is the sense that things are going along normally, is then an accomplishment. Okay? It's something people do and have to keep doing for it to work. Now, again, that's what the the chapters from Beyond Caring are sort of about, is about the nature of routine and how people get there and so on. Just so you know, I think it's incomplete. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, I think those chapters are a good effort at an, at, at an answer, but they don't get all the way there. And I've got at least three more points to the five that are in that chapter that I think will help with some, but I'm curious to see what you come up with. All right, so uh, routine is an accomplishment. A uh, good example of that, have you ever been in a play? People been in a play? Lots of, yeah, yeah, pretty good number, okay. Were you scared? Nervous? Was it awkward? Okay, okay, mix, mix, okay. Um, it's, it can be very incredibly awkward uh, for some people because Somebody's calling attention to normal stuff. So, for instance, you're, you're in a play, <clears throat> and the director says, okay, okay, Dan, uh, <clears throat> walk across the room and pick up the telephone. Phone on the table. At this point, you're supposed to, so you're like, okay. <laughs> I 
Hello? And he's like, Dan, all right, wait. Go back. All right. Relax, the director says. Take it easy. Just walk across the You know, you're like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's hard to be normal under that sort of situation, right? Under those conditions. Just talk, they say. It's not that easy, you know, because because you're trying to to make the taken for granted stuff look taken for granted when it isn't. Now, a good example of this will be you when you graduate from Hamilton. You're going to have to go, you're going to have to get up and walk up to the front of the stage and walk up some stairs and walk across the stage and Joan Stewart or whoever's there at that point, Joan Stewart, going to shake your hand and hand you your diploma and then you're going to trip and fall down in front of 7,000 people. That's what you're going to be thinking, like, oh, I don't want to fall down. From <laughs> you know, and I got these shoes, and I got this dress, and I'm doing this up the stairs. It's a little bit awkward walking across the stage in front of 7,000 people. All right? Okay. At any rate. All right, so, but normally, routines are routine, right? You don't think about them, and that's what makes them routine, is you don't think about them. That's part of the definition, is you don't have to think about it, you're not self-conscious, it's just kind of built in. It's embodied. It's a physical habit in the way you do it. It's a physical habit. Now, again, situational definitions can be fragile. I'll give you a few more anecdotes about this. Uh, uh, T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Um, I was in college, there was an English professor. He was talking about this, and there's a, there's a, a line in the, in the poem about I grow old, I grow old, I wear my trouser bottoms rolled, which apparently is something men used to do a long time ago when they got old for some reason. Anyway, so Dr. Charter, the teacher, jumps up on the table, <laughs> that kind of guy, and says, do I wear my trouser bottoms rolled? And a student says, no, Dr. Charter, but your fly is open. <laughs> Uh, collapse, right? I mean, it's like, oh, uh, 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 okay. Yeah. This kind of business, right? He had been going in a direction. Everything was going along fine. Great class. He's excited. You know, boom, boom, boom. Boom, crash, right? Different example. Not that different in some ways. Uh, I was in graduate school. True story, right? These are all true stories. I was in graduate school, graduate seminar in sociological theory. 20 people in the room. We're all sitting there being real serious. We're talking about, I don't know. Max Weber or Georg Zimmel or somebody like that. And the professor starts out and he's talking. He had a cold. He also had a big bushy beard with a big bushy mustache. And he had a cold. Did I tell you that part? <laughs> and early in the class, probably 20 minutes in, this was a three hour seminar, he sneezed massively. <laughs> and was evidently unaware of what was left on the mustache. And for the next two hours, so there's a problem. You're a grad student, right? The guy's an eminent professor. You're like, ah, uh, you got a booger in your mustache. <laughs> now, what do you say? Right? I mean, it was just, for two hours and 40 minutes, we continued with this seminar trying to act as if this discussion of Weber's theory of rationalization was really what we're thinking about. <laughs> and we weren't. We're like, oh, Weber, if, uh, if uh, the capitalist enterprise, <laughs> you know, people are looking at each other, they're looking at their notes. You're trying to carry on a routine when it's a totally non-routine situation. Other things can happen. You can overhear gossip about yourself, right? See your own recommendation letters. I'll tell you a story about that, not this time, but next time. Seeing your own recommendation letters. Don't do it. It's generally a bad idea. I'm just letting you know. You know, if they're supposed to be confidential, don't do it. Even if they're good, doesn't matter. Not the point. I'll tell you a story about that. Or you, like you, you're walking down the hall and you hear people talking, and you stop, and then you listen, and you're like, it's about me. Not good. You don't, don't go there. Okay, uh, in all sorts of ways then, alternative situational definitions, we might call them. Where are we? Ooh, 
There we are. Can threaten things in everyday life. Uh, this is what jokes are about in some ways, or putting people on. Con games are all about this, or about how you abuse people's understanding. They think this is a normal transaction. You're trying to help. Hey, listen, I just found this thing. You, somebody calls you up and they say, you are about to inherit $28,714. You had a, a second cousin who died and his father had predeceased him and all of everything he left was to your parents and now it's supposed to come to you. $27,814 is coming your way. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, this is so-and-so, yeah, yeah, this and right. And you're like, oh, no way, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. We need, we need you to set up an account at this bank uh, there's a $38 fee, you know, to set, right? And then you get in, and you know, they start setting up, and then they say, oh, we need $200 transferred to such and such. And it depends how long it goes before you realize, hey, wait a minute, they're taking my money mm -hmm. on the promise. But you sort of assume, person sounded nice. Oh, he seemed perfectly normal. He looked, you know, he's wearing a coat and tie when I met him. Right? Con games are about taking the situational definition that people, you know, and all the clues and playing them so the person thinks this is okay. This is what it appears. And then they're cheating you out of that real meaning. Lots of stuff can happen. Um, when I was in, um, I was in eighth grade, I guess, eighth or ninth grade, and I had this, you know, let's say friend, okay, but it was like a school friend. You know, it's because we happened to sit next to each other in math class. Anyway, so his, his name was, uh, well, I won't tell you his name. But anyway, so, <laughs> that wouldn't be nice. Um, for some reason, my father couldn't come pick me up after school. This guy was like two years older than I was, so he, had, he was driving. And I said, can you give me a ride into town at the end of the day? Because my father worked downtown. So, it's, you know, it's like five miles. I said, sure. So at the end of the day, uh, we went out to his car, and he had this big station wagon. I don't know, you know what station wagons are? These kind of anyway, he had all this crap in the, all this stuff in the back, because um, his father worked for the fire department, basically. But had all the, you know, like tanks of oxygen and ropes and ladders and this kind of stuff crammed in the back of the car. Fine, okay. I get in the car, and we sit down, and I'm like, okay, we're getting ready to go, and I see on the on the dashboard in front of me. Uh, is a billy club, like a police baton, mounted in brackets. And, like, you know, uh, and then, okay. And then I notice over by the door, on his side of the door, there's a can of mace. You know what I mean by mace? Like stuff that like hurts people real bad if you spray them with it. He's got a can of mace on the bracket of the door. It's the kid's car. You know, okay, maybe his dad. I don't know. And I'm kicking something underneath. And I look underneath the seat, and under the seat is a sawed-off shotgun. And I'm like, so, uh, buddy, uh, how come you got all this stuff in the car? And he said, and I quote, there are people who'd like to get me. <laughs> You're a freaking ninth grader, you know? <laughs> I don't think it's... I'm in the car with a lunatic, <laughs> right? He's now a police officer, by the way. But uh, it's true. I'm not making this up. And, you know, so I, I got my ride into town, but that was it. I didn't want to ride with him anymore. Or um, I'll tell you one other little example. One other little example. So um, uh, you know who Jodie Foster is? Jodie Foster is an actor, right? Actress. Uh, and she was famous <coughs> from very young age. And she was in all kind of great movies when she was a kid. And I was a big, big Jodie Foster fan. So this is, like, go to 1979, 1980. I'm a graduate student at Yale in sociology. I'm teaching a class. I'm teaching a research methods class. And my fantasy, uh, Jodie Foster enrolls at Yale as an undergraduate. Okay? I'm like, she's going to take my class. I'm convinced. And I'm every, my, my fellow grad students know about this, and they think this is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. She's not going to take my class. But anyway, I think maybe Jodie Foster would take my class. I, I thought she was fabulous in Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane, for instance. It's kind of a horror. It's great. She kills her father, buries him in the base. Anyway. 
I'm sitting in the dining hall at the Yale Management School one day, eating lunch with my friend Diane, sitting across from each other. And it's a small dining hall. I mean, it'd be like, like McEwen, basically. I'm sitting there, and a group of, you know, I mean, they're all kind of people going in and out. And sort of vaguely on the side of my awareness, a group of freshmen walk in. You know, a bunch of, bunch of kids sit down at our table. And I'm talking to Diane, and she starts doing this. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm just, you know, we're just, and she does one of this, she does, I let, actually she was going that way, I was sitting across from her, she was motioning to her left, right, like this, and I'm, I don't know, and I just, <laughs> right next to me, <laughs> great, it was a high point, okay. <laughs> That was it. That was the high point. So I, I sat next to Jody Foster at lunch in the Yale. I did not say hello. She looks like a freshman college. I mean, she's, you know, totally nondescript. Completely nondescript. You would have no notion whatsoever that this person is a world famous movie star if you didn't know that face. Okay, fine. But within months after this happened, so. I have this thing about Jodie Foster, everybody in the department knows this, you know, I've got a poster on my wall, whatever. I mean, it was kind of a, you know, lark, but whatever. Yeah. One day, a guy named John Hinckley at the Washington Hilton, Ronald Reagan's coming out of the Washington Hilton, John Hinckley shoots Reagan, bang, 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 right? Nearly kills the president. They immediately grab him, you know, there he is. And they ask him, why did you do it? And he says, what he said literally was, I did it for Jody. He had a crush on Jody Foster. That's why he tried to kill the president, to impress her. I, I had nothing to do with this, okay? I'm telling you, like, oh, no, not Jody Foster. No, no, I never had a thing about Jody. Take it out of the poster, right? Because all of a sudden, some claim or whatever has a meaning that is totally shifted in a matter of a day. All of a sudden what was a utterly benign kind of attitude becomes this, hey, oh my God, kill the president. Next thing you know, Dan's a nutcase or something. <laughs> anyway, so um, on Thursday we will talk about routinization, how people get used to being in very abnormal situations. Thank you very much.